as we've been preparing for this presentation. I'm just really excited to share with you what I've experienced over the years that I've been practicing the Alexander Technique and how it has pretty much transformed my life and my violin playing. So I do specialize in helping musicians, especially violinists, <laughs> how to feel better and play better with the Alexander Technique. And I call my particular brand of the Alexander Technique the art of freedom because it really does all boil down to our freedom of choice. I have three magic phrases. I'll just start by throwing those out there for you. They are, one, I am free. Two, I don't have to do anything right now. And three, I have time. Okay, so I'm not going to talk much about those, but that's sort of the groundwork, the frame that I put all of my work into, because you are free. You are free to think or not think whatever you want. Your mind is free and your body is free to feel exactly the way it feels right now. And actually, one of the main premises of Alexander Technique is this fact that the mind and the body are not separate. They're one thing. So every single thing that you think is reflected by your body. And that's great news because that means that we can choose our thoughts wisely <laughs> to create positive effects in our body. The not so good news though is that most of our thoughts go by so fast we don't even know we're thinking them. And so many of them are habitually not helpful. So Alexander Technique helps you to become more aware of how you're thinking and moving and what your habits are so that you can let them change. Because as soon as you start observing something, it changes. And to prove that, I'm just going to say the word breath. And I'm curious, did your breathing change or is it changing right now as soon as I said it? That's your first question of the day. Um, before I get more into questions and giving you now a little taste of the Alexander Technique, because I really do want you to come away from this presentation with um, something to help you, to that you can experience that makes sense to you. But before I go into all that, I want to say hello to my first person that says hello, and it's Kay. You know, I'm so grateful to Kay because Kay is the person who has connected me with this group. And Kay has been working with me for a year or two maybe now, just online. We don't live in the same place. I live in Cincinnati, Ohio, by the way, in the United States, and so I'm on Eastern time. <laughs> but I wanna thank Kay for making this possible. And again, thank you, Laura Lynn. It is so generous to welcome me here into your group. Much appreciate it. And I see Deb, yes. Hello, Deb. I want to welcome everybody here to just say hi when you come on. You don't have to say anything else if you don't want to. You can be quiet the whole time. Um, but I really love to know who's here. Um, if you want to just say where you're from, that's always kind of fun too. You can see where everybody's from. And um, these Facebook Lives are really fun for me, but it's more fun, <laughs> it's more enjoyable for everybody when we have kind of a two-way communication going on. So it's not just me lecturing out there and you see me and that's all there is. Um, I love to get your comments, your questions, your little emojis are, are great, even though, actually, I'm doing this directly through Facebook Live right now, so I will be able to see all your little emojis running by. <laughs> I think they're so cute. So anyway, um, hey, Annie, welcome. You're in Oregon. I'm actually going to Oregon next week. It is so beautiful there. Okay, so this presentation is actually pretty short. It's gonna be 20 to 30 minutes. And so obviously I can only give you the tiniest little bit of an introduction to the Alexander Technique, but um, it's really simple actually. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to get like the essence of it across to you so that you may be curious to investigate it a little more on your own. And you'll see um, if, oh, by the way, if you're watching the replay, you can still comment and I will see them if you tag my name, otherwise it may be hard for me to find, but tag me if you have a comment or a question that you wanna make sure later that I actually see. All right, so I wanna give you kind of a general picture of the Alexander Technique and how it can help you as a violinist. Um, I thought I would start by 
just telling you a tiny little bit about my own personal background um, as a violinist and Alexander Technique teacher. I actually got certified twice, <laughs> which is very unusual, but I really love it. And um, I wanted, I just, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life because it's so much fun. So I'm always learning more and sharing it with everybody. So here's my, in a nutshell, lifelong violin story, okay? So my parents are both musicians and I grew up with music before I was born. I'm sure I heard it in the womb. And so when I was two, I wanted to learn the violin and, and go figure a two year old wanting to learn the violin. So my parents hadn't heard of the Suzuki method yet, but they got me started when I was four. So I've been playing ever since. And when I was a kid and teenager, this was me, um, like tunnel vision, <laughs> violin, and that's all I cared about. So I did everything you're supposed to do to become a solo violinist. And actually I was quite successful. I did lots of competitions. I played with orchestras as a soloist internationally. Um, I studied with some of the best teachers in the world. Um, Gingold was a teacher of mine and Nathan Milstein, if you've heard those names, um, those were some of the great violinists. And so I feel very pri privileged to have, to have had loving support from great teachers and um, things came naturally for me. I feel very blessed from the time I was little playing the violin. I just loved it. It was fun. It was about community and sharing and just communicating my love of life and music with my instrument. Okay, so fast forward to age 20 when I got married and lots of things happened and I completely changed my, uh, my goals in life and I almost dropped the violin completely. Um, I'm not gonna go into why, <laughs> it's complicated, but I really didn't care so much about it anymore. So then there was this long period of more than two decades where I kept maintaining my skills as a violinist, but the truth is I barely practiced Sometimes I had really big concerts, like I played in Carnegie Hall, did a recital once. For that one, I practiced about a month in advance. <laughs> and then, but for most other things, the truth is I took my violin out maybe a couple of weeks before a rehearsal to make sure I knew the stuff. So my level of playing was already so high that I could maintain it without practicing. Now, I'm not saying that is desirable. I'm just saying I didn't really care for a long time. I didn't care about improving. I just wanted to play good enough. So, and something happened alongside that, which changed everything, okay? I started to get pain in my neck. I had two kids and um, I was carrying my toddler on my hip and so that was kind of screwing up my alignment. And I started getting this neck pain. So I went to the doctor, went to the chiropractor for months, nothing helped. And then I heard of the Alexander Technique. Lots of strange things happened <laughs> that allowed me to take those lessons. But as soon as I started taking Alexander Technique, my pain dissolved within a couple lessons. I was very fortunate. It's, always, it's not always so fast for everybody. People always learn right away, but their presenting symptoms don't always disappear so fast. So I don't want to get your hopes up about that. But mine actually did disappear completely very quickly. But everything in me started to shift and feel better. I had been actually pretty miserable at that point for lots of reasons, but I was miserable emotionally and physically, and Alexander Technique was like this miracle that saved me. <laughs> it came, it saved me out of misery, and I started to feel incredibly alive and wonderful, and I remember going home one day after a lesson, and I looked at my arm and like, oh my God, my arm can move so freely and flexibly, what's going on? So even though my neck, my neck pain was gone, I felt so great that I kept taking Alexander lessons. And I really wanted to, I'm the type that wants to understand why things work. So I got really deeply into it and I realized I wanted to become an Alexander teacher. So I did the three year training, it takes three years and 1600 hours to train to be an Alexander Technique teacher. So I did that and I started integrating my music into the Alexander Technique after I got certified. Actually, I started kind of during the training, but after I got certified, it was a, a long process of coming back to 
what I had known as a child when everything was easy, free, and filled with music and life. That was me as a kid. Um, I was also not too happy. I was also very, very, very shy as a kid. So um, the tunnel vision <laughs> on music was not so healthy for me. But leaving music and coming back was really amazing after decades. So I have a perspective from deep inside the musical world as a performer. And by the way, I've also played in orchestras and all over, all kinds of stuff. And I also have a perspective from outside of the music world looking in as a mind-body expert, um, knowing these things about how the mind and the body coordinate for easy, fluid movement of the arms, the spine, the legs, um, everything that you need to play your instrument, fingers, for instance. Okay, so that's my background. And now I want to get into you. Okay, so at this point, you know, please feel free to ask me any questions about anything or comment on anything. You can just go ahead and comment while I'm talking and I will make sure to stop at the end. Um, I think I'll probably talk for about 20 minutes or so and then I'll look at your questions and um, we'll go further um, in response to what's coming up for you. But any comments on anything I tell you are very welcome, okay? So, okay. Next thing I wanted to do is I wanted to just tell you that it was so great to read all of your comments about what you want to know about and your specific struggles. So I actually copied them out and I have them all here on a few pieces of paper. There's a lot of great stuff here. Thank you so much for taking the time to think about it. So I'm just going to read really quickly what I got from your comments. I'm not going to say who said what, but here are the things that people in this group want to know more about. Upper, middle, back, and shoulder pain. I can hold relaxed good form for a couple seconds and then I twist and droop and then there's a death grip in my fingers and my hand. Who? Okay, does anybody else ever experience a death grip? Please just give a thumbs, actually even angry if you have a death grip ever. <laughs> Give a little angry emoji. We never get to use those. In my groups, we're all happy, so there aren't that many, there aren't that many angry emojis. But yeah, okay, <laughs> you are free to use them here. Okay, so they're coming. All right, other people obviously know what the death grip is about. I talk about a couple of different kinds of death grip. Actually, for me, usually I call this the death grip. It's the shoulder clenching jaw neck death grip. Right? Anybody got that one? You can just type yes in there too if you've got that one. Then there's the, the bow grip, the death grip of the bow. And then there's the, the tight thumb that doesn't want to bend, right? And then the fingers that are like this. And you don't know what to do with your wrist because, yeah, those are all death grips and they're deadly. So you don't want that. <laughs> Definitely want to get out of those. Um, then we've got keeping the left hand free. I would say that's pretty much the same thing, but this person has a really great comment talking about keeping the left hand free because you, how do you support that instrument if you don't have that grip here and you don't have it here? How do you support the instrument? And the number one question that I usually get from violinists is setup. How do I adjust my setup so that I can hold the instrument without squeezing with my, in between my shoulder and head. So I actually offer a, a masterclass just on violin setup, and I'll probably schedule another one of those in the next um, month or so. But anyway, that's, that's a huge topic, okay? Then we've got tension, we've got anxiety, we've got someone who wants warm-ups and cool-downs. I will definitely talk about that. Um, how to keep the hand loose, I would say, with vibrato, I would say that's very related to the death grip. Um, here's someone who cramps up in general, again, related to the death grip. Um, pain, thumb grips too much, back hurts, bad posture. Um, someone asks, is it okay not to use a shoulder rest? That goes into the category of violin setup. Um, and setup is totally related to posture and how you're using your head and neck. So, that's again the same thing. Um, and by the way, very quick answer to the shoulder rest question. I can tell you just in a few words, it is absolutely okay to not use a shoulder rest if your body type requires that. And that's a huge if. I think that people need to be extremely open to 
adjusting setup to, to experimenting with setup. That's the big word, to experiment with setup, to find the setup that works best for your body because everybody is absolutely unique, different. And my experience with commercial shoulder rests is mostly negative. So I actually create my own and I have my students uh, make their own with my help because we fit them to your body and your shape and how it works. Wait, basically what you want is you want to be able to, just briefly, I'll show you. You want to be able to see how I'm just sort of me. <laughs> I'm normal Jennifer right now, as normal as I can be. <laughs> so I'm just here and my violin just kind of fits here and I haven't changed me, all right? I want to be able to be my normal self and have a violin here and not be affected by the violin. Okay, so I have to have a setup that fits here that allows me to bring up my arm and yet I don't have to clamp. So I can play like this or like this and my violin is free to move. It's not going to fall. It's not going to go anywhere. And I can even do this, you know, like with, with one finger, right? I'm not going to, I know I'm not going to drop my violin and I don't, I don't really need to do anything extra. And you see, I'm not squeezing with my shoulder. I'm not doing anything. That's the ideal that I want for, for all of you, okay? And it is totally achievable, but that doesn't mean it's easy right away, especially because there's a fear of dropping the violin, especially in the beginning, but even with the most elite professionals, because it's ingrained in there from the time you started, there's a fear of dropping the violin, and that fear causes you to tighten up. So it's a process learning to undo that tension and be fine with this being completely free while you play, okay? So that's my two cents on the shoulder rest. Um, some people really, really should not have a shoulder rest. Like if you have not much neck at all, and I have students like that, no shoulder rest. Nathan Milstein forced me <laughs> actually to play without a shoulder rest. I studied with him for five summers and he didn't have much of a neck. And he kind of forced me to play without a shoulder rest. And I said, but it keeps falling, it keeps slipping. So then he gave me his silk scarf to put there. And he says, oh, okay, so use that, which of course made it worse. But anyway, that's a little anecdote. <laughs> I, I tried not playing with a shoulder rest for years after that, and it worked fine. But later I, I realized that my neck was longer and I needed some, something to fill in that space. And so now I wouldn't recommend that unless you really don't have any space there. Um, and the last thing, oh, there's um, being able to play faster and how to relax. And spiccato, the spiccato is a specific violin technique, which, okay, all specific techniques work better when you have good coordination, obviously, when your mind and your body are connected and working well together. And this is huge. And you have minimal excess tension in your body. So spiccato, you need to be able to play a spiccato with a really loose wrist and fingers and arms and shoulder. And if this is tight up here, everything has to pass through the head neck. If this is tight, everything lower down has more tension than necessary. So you've got to start by addressing this. Absolutely, that's what Alexander discovered in himself. And he had a performance issue. Um, Alexander was an actor born in 1869, and he developed um, hoarseness when he got on stage that wasn't helped by vocal specialists or doctors because there was nothing wrong with his mechanism. So he, through a process of experimentation and self-observation, that's huge, those two things are very important, observation and, and uh, self-observation and experimentation, through a long process over years, he learned all kinds of amazing things about how the mind and body coordinate and connect so that you can have more control over what you're doing. Basically, that's what we're learning. And Alexander said, I'll quote him, mine is a method for the control of human reaction. So when you bounce your bow, that's something that you can react to, right? Well, we need to be able to develop conscious, constructive, control over what we're doing with ourselves. That's what Alexander Technique is in, in a nutshell. Okay, so um, time is flying. Here's something I want you to, oh, sorry, before I give you something to try, I just wanted to say that these comments, <laughs> if you were listening, you'll see they fall into pretty much three categories. Uh, maybe, I, I, I guess, four. 
Okay, so you've got the pain category. Put a, put a yes if you have pain. Say, write pain if you ever have pain when you play. Okay, let's see in the comments how many of you have pain when you play. That would be interesting. So then there's, there's the pain category. Then there's the excess tension, I want to learn how to relax when I play category. And um, you can just write relax in there if that's your number one. Then there's the third one. The third one is negative thinking, basically. Um, Self-sabotaging thoughts. That includes performance anxiety. So if you have, um, uh, let's say, an inner monologue, <laughs> put a yes <laughs> if you've got negative thinking. And then if you've got all three of these, put three. Just type the number three in there. And then you fall into all three of those categories. And I said there are four. The fourth one is the specific techniques category. That's like learning spiccato or vibrato or all those things. The specific techniques have to fit into this big picture, though, of how you use yourself, which is your primary instrument. If you're like this all day long, you go around like this all tight, and then you try to play the violin, obviously you're not going to sound very good, right? <laughs> if throughout the day you are working on your primary instrument, to coordinate yourself well and to find more ease in yourself throughout the day, you're getting very good at that. And then you're going to bring that to your violin playing and everything you do is going to be a heck of a lot easier. I promise. <laughs> okay, so the big million dollar question of today is how you do it. Glad you asked. <laughs> so how do you start to improve how you're using your mind body primary instrument. That's my specialty. So this is where I can help you. And your first step, actually let's call it the pre-step because I, I'm giving you the real first step um, in that link that I put at the top of this post. Um, that's where I really would love for you to go next. I'm gonna teach you a two minute Alexander Technique Etude um, just for free, Don't, there's no obligation here. You will be on my uh, mailing list if you do that because I need to be able to send it to you <laughs> um, with a little bit of, you know, a few words as well. So if you want that, you can just opt into that and I'll send it to you immediately. I have it all set up for you. Okay, but before you do that, it's really important that you know what I'm going to teach you right now. Okay, so I have a question for everybody here right now. And then the question is, when you stop for a moment and you check in with yourself, what do you notice about your body right now? And go ahead and type your answer to that question into the comments right now. Even if you're watching the replay, I wanna get your comments, okay? What do you notice about yourself? What do you notice about your body specifically right now? What do you notice? What's showing up for you? What's happening? What do you notice? And I'm going to wait a moment because there's always the delay with these live videos. So I would love to see what's coming up for you. What are you experiencing right now as you sit there and you're watching the screen? Are you feeling anything going on in your body? What's, what's coming up? What's popping up? Um, for some reason, I'm not seeing... Uh, okay, now they're starting to come up. Okay, all right, so we've got um, bad posture. Um, give a thumbs up if you think you have great posture, if your posture doesn't need any work. Probably won't see many thumbs up coming by <laughs> because most people think they have to improve their posture, especially playing the violin. Okay, um, low back is popping up. Laura Lynn is very relaxed, lovely. Desiree is tense. Terry has back pain, Gail is relaxed, Kay has an achy back, sorry. And Zach says, my neck is sort of stooping forward like a vulture. I bet you're not the only one, Zach, because this is a very common thing when people are at a screen. They're sort of doing this, right? <laughs> if anybody else is doing that, say, you know, give, give Zach a thumbs up because that is so common. Okay, so if you'll notice from the comments, you can either notice something that's kind of negative or something that's kind of positive. And I don't like to actually put them in that category because we wanna learn how to observe ourselves without judgment. 
right? So it's not negative, it's not positive, but you may like it or not, okay? So let's say there is relative tension or discomfort in some areas of your body, and there's relative easing or freedom or comfort in other areas of your body. Now, the first skill that you need to develop as, you know, when you're learning the Alexander Technique is how to get really in touch with yourself and become more sensitive to what's actually going on in the present moment in yourself to become aware of what you're thinking, your mood, and very much to become aware of what's going on in your body. As a musician, you need to be very sensitive in every way. So this is a way that is absolutely, every single time you ask this question, what do I notice about myself right now? You are improving as a violinist. You are absolutely 100% guaranteed for sure improving yourself as a musician when you ask yourself this question. So congratulations to everybody here. You just became a better musician. <laughs> no, I'm absolutely serious. So this is the question you want to start asking yourself very frequently and to develop a practice that helps you do that, okay? So the next thing I want you to do, this is like pre-step number two. Now that you know that you can find tension or comfort in your body, and it's always changing by the way. I'm sure you know this, sometimes you feel great, sometimes you don't. It's always changing and it's always about what's happening right now. Now that you know that there are those, there's that relative ease or relative tension going on all the time, I want you now to ask yourself a different question. Ask yourself, where in my body do I notice a little bit of easing or relative comfort? Is there a place in my body that feels just fine right now? Or is there a place in my body that feels less painful or less tight than the place that you noticed first? Is there a place in your body where it's pretty quiet, not much going on, okay? Even people in chronic pain with serious health problems, when they do this practice, they can always get to find a place where it's not quite as bad. Even if everything seems bad, there's always a place that is a little less bad, but you've got to seek it to find it. What you seek, you shall find, and it's always there. Ease is always in your system. It's a, it's a, it's a musical flow, okay? We are musical beings, and there's an energetic flow inside of us. And when we're musicians, that energetic flow is what carries the music out through, from your mind, from your, from your brain, through your nervous system, out your limbs, and then out your violin. We need to learn how to step into that flow, and it starts by becoming more sensitive to the ease in your body and how that shifts and moves inside of you. It's alive, this is your life force, <laughs> okay? So getting in touch with that ease in your body is crucial. So I'd love to see the answers that pop up for you right now, or your questions. Where do you notice ease in yourself? Where do you notice an easing? or comfort, relative, it's all relative, right now, okay? Laura Lynn, I'm, I love that you're saying the flow is so true. It's like stepping into a river and the music does itself once you learn how to do that. And it's all about letting go and trusting, I tell you. This is a training in letting go and trusting. <laughs> uh, Zach says left shoulder and back, wonderful, wonderful. Laura, miraculously my back is at ease this morning. Yay! <laughs> Let's give a heart to Laura, Laura Lynn, because <laughs> that's wonderful. I'm really happy about that. Kay says ankles. Annie says arms. Zach says left leg. Fabulous. I'm so glad you're being able to connect to those places, okay? So um, I'm going to leave you in a moment, but I want to check and see if anybody's got any questions um, really briefly that have come up that I've missed. Um, Kay says, I'm so much better since I've been doing the Alexander Technique exercises I've learned so far. Kay, you are just doing great. And Kay is very consistent. You see, I give two minutes of homework to my students every day. Actually, it's not homework, it's fun work. I have to change that. <laughs> it's not homework. We do fun work twice a day, and it takes like two minutes when you first start out, and it's never more than five or ten minutes, even when you've been doing it for a long time. So twice a day. Can you devote four minutes a day 
to improving your well-being and your music making? That's my next question. I'm not seeing any other questions popping up from you, so I'm going to leave you with a question. Oh, here's one, sorry. Um, can you be too relaxed, like becoming sloppy? Ooh, yes, yes. Great question. I'm glad you asked that because it's very important that you realize this is not a relaxation technique. It absolutely is not. You may start to feel more relaxed, but you're going to be more energized too. This is, I don't like to use the word relaxation because most people think of collapsing when they relax, right? And if you think of just, just, just like a floppy arm, look what happens to my coordination. Look what happens to my alignment. It's like everything just kind of, huh, and there's no energy. That's, uh, that's blocking the energetic flow, the musical flow, just as much as stiffening and trying really hard. Both extremes are not desirable. What we want is a happy medium, which is how you're designed. Your natural design is upright and open and flowing, filled with energy and light and joy. And that's what you want to learn how to convey through your music. But you can only do that when you learn how to not interfere. So this is actually a subtraction technique <laughs> where you're learning to do less. And it's very, 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 very powerful and easy. It's so simple. Um, OK, Gail says, is this similar to mindfulness? It is similar, yes. Um, however, well, I mean, there are so many different ways to practice mindfulness and meditation. So I would just say that the Alexander Technique is unique among all the things that I've come across in my life, which are many, <laughs> many, like body work or um, meditation practices. I've, I've, I've gotten into many, many things. And the Alexander Technique is unique because you are really learning how to connect your thinking with your body in a way that is constructive so that you're using your thinking to get your thinking out of the way. Um, I, so it is similar to mindfulness and meditation. And sometimes it even seems meditative. The etude I'm going to give you now in a moment um, is actually rather meditative. Um, but you'll see it's also energizing. And that's that's really important to keep in mind. I don't like to use the word relaxation. Don't use it <laughs> because there's too many habits of uh, just kind of, kind of collapsing that go in with that. So those are great, great questions. And feel free to keep asking the questions and tag me if you want to make sure I see them. And um, I will respond after I'm done. So I've gone over time. Oh, sorry, I'm going to answer just this last one that popped up. How similar is AT to body mapping? Um, Body mapping actually originated out of Alexander Technique. Barbara and Bill Conable invented body mapping. They were both certified Alexander Technique teachers. Um, but it has sort of branched away from the Alexander Technique um, in some ways. I myself personally um, am really not interested in body mapping. I think occasionally, it, you know, there are some situations where it's useful, but it's I just find the Alexander Technique, um, the way that I teach it, which, you know, Art of Freedom with the hands off um, and really paying attention to ease is just so much faster and easier. And you don't have to go into uh, making things too intellectual. It's extremely practical. You do it and it just works. But no, there's a lot of merit to body mapping and it is related. So, um, yeah. That's all I'm going to say about body mapping. <laughs> I have a lot of dear friends that do body mapping. So, um, yeah. Okay. So I am going to finish up because I went over as usual. I'm not very good at ending exactly when I say I will. Um, but here's my last question for you. I want you to imagine something. What if you had a tool that you could access at any moment in any situation? whether there are people around or not, what if you had something you could do for yourself backstage, in the middle of a performance, at home in the practice room, when you're driving? What if you had something that, that were so powerful that you could notice instantly an improvement in yourself or a change or you just increase your awareness instantly? 
What if you had something like that, that if you could practice it consistently on a regular basis, every single time you do it, you get better at it, and every single time you do it, your violin playing automatically improves. Would you like to have that? <laughs> Give me a yes if you want that, or a thumbs up, <laughs> or a heart, or something. Let's see a whole bunch of a flurry of something because I'm going to give it to you, okay? Of course, if you don't want it, you don't have to ask for it. You don't have to get it. But if you do want it, and Laurelyn wants it, yay. <laughs> Great, I'm seeing a flurry of those fun emojis that are, I love seeing those. And Annie wants it, yes. Great, and Zach, oh, I'm so glad I've got your attention. Yes, wonderful. Okay, so I promise this etude is two minutes. I mean, more or less, a few seconds, more or less. It takes two minutes to do this etude. And the video that I'm going to give you teaches you how to do it in 10 minutes, but it's so easy, so simple, you'll be, be doing it instantly. So that's what I'm gonna send you. You have the link up at the top. Um, I'm going to make sure it's there when I turn this off. And that's what I got for you today. I hope this was interesting and useful and helpful. And I really would love to help you more in any way. So you know where to find me on Facebook. You know how to ask me questions if you've got them. Tag me in this group if you want. I'll probably be leaving this group since I'm not technically a member. Probably won't be here too much longer. <laughs> but for now, today, you can tag me anywhere in this group, and I'll make sure that I, I follow up with you and let me know how I can help, okay? So thank you so much for being here, and you're very welcome, Gail and everyone, and I wish you happy practicing, happy experimenting and exploring, and um, lots of love, okay? Bye-bye for today. <laughs>